Hello and welcome. My name is Samantha Black. I am the Executive Director of True Pace for True Community Care. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the True Cares Luncheon for the fourth year in a row. While we had hoped to gather together this year in person, alas, COVID continues in our world and we just wanna keep everyone safe. So thank you for joining us on this platform. Most importantly, we are together. We are connected through our shared mission to support the people in our community facing advanced illness and loss. We are united by a common purpose and we are thrilled that you chose to join us here today. We wouldn't be here today without the generous support of our sponsors. We would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our platinum sponsors as of October 5th. Robert K. and Sydney M. Anderson, BOK Financial, Centura through Longmont United Hospital, St. Anthony's North Hospital, and Avista Adventist Hospital. And special thanks to our gold sponsors as of October 6th, Academy of Boulder, the Blank and Prince families in honor of Nancy Prince, Ewing Levitt Insurance Agency Incorporated, Frazier, Scott and Marlene Gresser, Griswold Home Care, Home Instead Senior Care, and One Point Patient Care. And finally, thanks so much to all of the silver sponsors listed on your screen. We would like to start our program by telling you about some of our accomplishments from the last year. So as we look back on this most incredible year, there is so much to celebrate at True. First and foremost, we provided uninterrupted care for our patients, participants, clients, and families during an ongoing pandemic. As you can imagine, this is no small task. We continue to secure and provide PPE for all of our staff. We followed all safety protocols to protect everyone we interact with and we strengthened our telecare program to provide better just-in-time care, especially when in-person care was not an option. Like everyone in the healthcare industry and in so many other industries, we faced and continue to face a severe labor shortage. We have taken several steps to address this concern in 2021. We instituted a cross-departmental team that meets twice weekly to brainstorm out-of-the-box ideas to combat the shortage. Not only did we offer sign-on bonuses for hard-to-fill positions, as others in the industry have done, but we also felt it was important to offer retention bonuses to all of our staff members, regardless of how long they've been with True, to show our appreciation and honor for their dedication and commitment to weather this storm, all of us together. We routinely survey the market to make sure our wages and benefits remain competitive. We work with a national nurse recruiting firm to identify qualified candidates both nationally and locally. We've hired travelers to fill key open positions on a temporary basis throughout the agency. We're investing and growing our own staff by offering CNA to RN and LPN to RN scholarships and creating a new graduate nursing residency program. And this is by no means a complete list of all we are doing behind the scenes to address the shortage, keep up with our growth, take care of our employees, and ensure continued high quality care of our patients and families. Despite the challenges we faced, we managed to grow all of our programs and serve more people in our community than ever before in the history of True. To support this wonderful growth, we continue to expand our telecare programs. We grew our remote patient monitoring program serving hospice and palliative care patients, reducing hospital readmissions, improving patient and family satisfaction, and providing just-in-time care for those who needed us. Thanks to generous foundation support, we provided grand pads to PACE participants. Grand pads uses technology designed specifically with seniors in mind. PACE tested the use of the GrandPad technology to impact mental health outcomes and healthcare utilization costs fostered by isolation during the COVID-19 pandemic for our participants. We hired a chief medical officer and grew our provider team. True reached a point this year where we grew large enough to warrant having our very own chief medical officer. 
and we were fortunate to recruit Dr. David Wenzel for the role. I'm excited for you to hear directly from Dr. Wenzel later today. With Dr. Wenzel's help and with True's reputation, we have grown to a wonderful and well-rounded team of three physicians, six nurse practitioners, and counting across the agency. We expanded our hospice and palliative care reach by expanding services into Denver and establishing a satellite office in the Rhino area. We formed the Landmark Advisory Council to explore the highest and best use of Landmark Memory Care Campus with the ultimate goal of providing recommendations for additional buildings and potential new programs and services to be offered on the campus for people living with dementia and other related diagnoses. And finally, we played an important role in helping our community process the shock and grief in response to the tragic events in Boulder on March 22nd. We offered multiple support groups and grief processing sessions led by trained facilitators. We extended free individual counseling to interested employees, and we hosted a community candlelight ceremony for people to gather in person to hold space together for our broader community. And so, there is so very much that we are proud to share and celebrate with you for 2021. Speaking of Landmark, today we're going to highlight a beloved Landmark resident who I had the honor of getting to know through her time in the PACE program. Mary Rippey, or Bobby as we knew her, was a force of life and a force of love. We met her in the later chapter of her life when her illness was slowly affecting her memory and her mobility. Bobby was a daily presence at PACE. She was the welcome wagon and the PACE ambassador for all visitors, and she looked after all of us. Bobby was a lover of animals of all types and sizes, we spent many hours talking about cats and puppies and poring over pictures and books. She was a firecracker. She was mischievous. She lived life on her terms. And despite her health changes, we loved her for her indomitable spirit. I hope you enjoy this brief glimpse into Bobby's life, the way we took care of her, and the way she impacted many of us here at True. Oh my gosh. Everybody loved my mom. All of my friends always wanted to be at our house. They considered Bobby, uh, I think, as important to be around and as fun to be around as me. And um, she just embraced everybody. She was a wild child when she was younger. Um, she had some bumps in the row that was really hard for a woman uh, growing up in the 50s and 60s. Uh, she was very independent. She had clear ideas about what she wanted to do and who she wanted to be, and it didn't necessarily fit the mold for that era. My name is Beth Jett. I am Bobby Rippey's daughter, and um, I call her Bobby Rippey because as a teenager, <laughs> just to get under her skin, I, well, I called her Bobby, and it just stuck. Bobby was first diagnosed with Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's in 13 years ago. The first diagnosis that she received was for Parkinson's and we became concerned after she began tripping and falling. Uh, she stayed with us, she lived with us to help me raise my kiddos and her space was in the basement of our house and she started falling down the stairs to the, in the basement and other things were happening along with that. Um, she would um, have these nightmares that would wake her up and she would lash out in these nightmares. And that was a problem that we dealt with throughout the entirety of that 13 year diagnosis through to her death. And a few years after she was diagnosed with Parkinson's, we were noticing some memory issues and we took her to a, um, a psychiatrist that specializes in geriatric diagnosis, diagnoses. And um, she was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia. At the time, we didn't really know what that mean, what that meant. My mom would remember things in her mind and not be able to pull them out of her mouth. <laughs> not be able to pull the thoughts from her mind and, and speak them clearly. And for her, that was a huge source of frustration. And then she would forget what she was saying. Uh, trying to say and so we had to intuit frequently what was going on in her mind what she was saying and to be honest um, 
as her only child here in Colorado, um, that was a big burden for me. And having other people here at Pace um, in her life that knew her well from a medical perspective really helped me manage my mom's disease as it progressed. Uh, having that team really helped us tremendously. Whew, Bobby. <laughs> she, she's one of a kind. She was a spunky, spunky lady. We hit it off immediately. You just kind of have that rapport and just kind of feeling that um, you'd be friends on the outside of, of this environment. Um, just seeing her smile, have getting a hug from Bobby. She was feisty. I mean, if she didn't want to do something, she'd dig her heels in and that was it. Like you couldn't get her to change her mind. Um, so staff would often call me to come out to kind of assist with Bobby. I'd sit down and kind of have some banter back and forth. She'd give it to me, I'd give it back to her. Um, she, she's truly one of a kind and I was so grateful to be able to have any, any part of her care here at Landmark. So Bobby would tell us stories. She loved animals. She loved like safaris. She had a, a stuffed possum that she would carry around with her. Beth had decorated her room amazingly, had um, safari animals, elephants, and different um, animals on her, on her walls. I mean, it looked like you were going into a safari when you walked into Bobby's room. It was awesome. Um, she, she would, her love of animals was really what shone through. Um, her relationship with her daughter Beth was amazing. Her grandkids, her son-in-law, I mean, she, she lit up whenever she would see any of her family. Um, and then as well as she was able to hold my son um, when he was a newborn, I brought him in just for a visit. This was pre-COVID um, and brought him in and Bobby's face just lit up when she saw my baby. So I set her, oh, I set her down in the recliner and she was able to hold my son. She was the only resident here that I allowed to do that. Um, and I have pictures that, you know, just mean the world to me, seeing her with him and any kids that would come in, like any preschoolers that would come in, um, her face would light up. Um, with that as well. Any animals that would come, therapy dogs, I would bring my dog Phoenix um, before COVID. And she just, she loved Phoenix. Phoenix loved her, I think not only because of Bobby, but because of the food she would give him. <laughs> so she would share with that as well. But um, Bobby's just an amazing lady. We were thankful to have her. The Louis body dementia, made the Parkinson's part of it worse because she couldn't remember that she wasn't supposed to walk. She couldn't remember that she was supposed to take medications at a certain time of day. She couldn't remember that she was not supposed to drive um, or use, she couldn't remember to use her walker. Um, and so the entire experience for this woman who was so vibrant and so freedom seeking this was a terrible disease um, and very hard for one person, one person's family to, to navigate on, on our own. I watched a video on Facebook um, of some PACE staff des des describing what was um, possible, what was available, what services were available. And I was like, what? This, she, my mom can have only social security, um, no life savings, um, and qualify for all of these, all of these um, levels of care. My mother, uh, before PACE, she had supplemental insurance that's common for people to have in addition to uh, Medicaid in their old age, um, but no guidance on what was really available. So everything that, that we would do with her, we didn't know how it would be paid for. We didn't, we didn't understand, the, the, the system is so complex. Uh, we didn't know that she could qualify for Medicaid. Um, all of this be were some of the first things that came to light when we started working with Pace. Pace was so concerned about my mom as a human being. The social workers, the medical staff, the daycare staff, the front office staff, 
Everybody was concerned about my mom as a human being. We never had any qualms about trusting the staff at Pace. So Bobby, I mean, when she first moved in, I, I was so surprised I, like from meeting her and seeing the way that she was, like, it was surprising to me that, you know, that she had, you know, that going on in her mind. And because she was always, like the way that she spoke and the words that she would use, like, I was like amazed, you know, I was like, there is no way. But then, you know, throughout the days that, you know, when we got to know her more, um, you know, she would have her good days, she would have her bad days, like anyone. And there was times where she would have like moments of clarity and she would just cry and cry. And, you know, like there wasn't much that we could do other than to offer a hug or, you know, to let her cry it out because, you know, it, it's always hard seeing them like that when, when they know what, what they have going on and that they realize that they're losing their mind. And during COVID, the ways that we connected with my mom were of course through Zoom calls, regular weekly Zoom calls. We connected with her um, through visits through the fence when the weather was decent. We were lucky enough to have one occasion where the hug tent was brought over to Landmark and we were able to reach our arms through. My daughter and I were able to go and reach our arms through and hug my mom. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. Uh, she was so happy just to touch us, and I will never forget what it felt like to touch my mom after a year. Um, that was so important for us to be able to do that with her. When Pace contracted with Landmark, it was a blessing because we loved Landmark. We loved that it was started by a small family with personal interest in um, creating a space that was like a home for people with memory issues. When we transitioned my mom to hospice, it was emotionally a hard decision. I had to sit with it for a couple of weeks because it just meant that more of my mom's life was peeling away from her. We brought together like six different people. We brought together people from hospice, from her uh, medical care team, from the occupational therapy team, from the PACE administration, um, and the administration at Landmark to discuss my mom through a Zoom call. Um, I was on it, my brother was on it, my husband was on it. Where, where else do you find an organization willing to bring that many diverse people in to talk about one little 100 pound lady's healthcare decisions. Um, I came on with Bobby kind of towards the end of her care um, in hospice and she was just so sweet and every time you came in she had something nice to say. She was always a lot of energy. She would just, you know, bubble of energy. She would get up and walk on her own and, you know, she would just light up the room. And uh, so my mom was on hospice um, in Landmark for a number of months before she had a fall that resulted in um, a complex brain bleed. So she fell, she hit her head. The doctor at the ER told me she had a brain bleed, that it was unlikely to stop, and that this was probably not going to be something that would resolve for my mom. We, we brought my mom home to Landmark. It was very clear she was sleeping the entire time. It was very clear that what was happening was not normal for Bobby. I still held out hope, but you know, she's slowly starting to deteriorate and I'm coming to the realization that my mom is not going to recover. And as I'm having that realization, I know that I need to bring my mom to my house. It's time for her to come home. It's time for her to be with us, um, to let us take care of her and do the most that we can for her. 
as she's dying, this is what she wanted. There was a change in her that I can't describe when we brought her home. She just, she just relaxed. Um, it took her a while to, for her body to go through the process of passing away. Her last two days, she was breathing and that was pretty much all that she was doing. Um, we also had home health care with us at night so that we could rest and have some breaks from my mom. And they were um, all people who had been with Bobby before while she was at Landmark. And that helped the transition ease, be easier too because they knew her, they cared about her. It was actually the middle of the night when she passed. Um, we were in our bedroom, I got a call from the home health care person who was with Bobby, who knew my mom very well. Um, and he called and said, Bobby's breathing is becoming more erratic. I think this is it. I think you should come, come out of your bedroom and, and see her. But it just, her, bro her breathing slowed and slowed and slowed. And it just was, it was over. It's been an amazing journey. Um, <laughs> being with one organization for so many years of my mother's life at my mom's memorial service that we had yesterday. Samantha came, Kelly came, uh, and it was so nice having people outside of my immediate family that understood how hard it was for my mom and for us and for them, <laughs> honestly, the last few years of her life. The true organization has been like family for us. It's that level of support that we receive from them. And I will never forget it. Hello there, I'm Dr. David Wenzel, the Chief Medical Officer for True Community Care. I have been the Chief Medical Officer at True for going on 10 months now. True Community Care has a real continuum of care for especially frail elders, and I think Bobby's a great example of that. And the PACE team and the True Hospice team collaborated together to provide her care to improve her quality of life, make sure that she was symptom free or at least her symptoms were better controlled and that she was able to move into her daughter's home and provide that in-home support so that she could stay there. Uh, because we know when PACE programs and hospice programs collaborate like that, the PACE participants always live longer and their quality of life is always better. Um, and they're often living where they want to live rather than having to be placed in a facility or a nursing home. So the collaboration between the PACE team and the hospice team is a great example of that continuum of services uh, that TRUE provides in the communities we serve. Uh, we have many other services we provide, but it's primarily to care for those who otherwise would not get care or would have to be uh, cared for in a facility. I came to True Community Care at the beginning of 2021, sort of in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, I came here because of the mission and vision and purpose of the people that are working here. Um, I have known uh, several of the people that work here for a long time and have always been impressed by the commitment to the communities that, that True serves, and I came here to sort of help continue that. Um, through that continuum of care that we provide at True, we are able to touch many lives in the communities that we serve and to help many patients and families as they transition from uh, chronic illness to end-of-life care. Um, before coming to True, I was the chief medical officer at a, a a nonprofit hospice PACE program and palliative care program in central Kansas for the last 12 years. And I have always uh, made a point to work at uh, nonprofit, usually smaller um, hospices, PACE programs, palliative care programs, and was really drawn to True because of the leadership here and the commitment that True has to the communities and the people that we serve. One of the greatest things that excites me about the future of true community care and the future of healthcare in general is that we're moving away from a fee-for-service model into a risk-sharing model 
with Medicare and ultimately will do that with Medicaid and other commercial insurance entities. And so I just, I'm, I'm very excited about what the future holds for true, true community care and the legacy that we're building here in this community to continue the long history that True has of caring for uh, very frail, vulnerable patients in the communities we serve. I mean, True Community Care has been here for 40 years. This is not new, and we are beginning to push the envelope and boundaries of, of the way medical care is provided. Um, that's why we need everybody's help to come together to do, to do that, because we are going to continue doing everything we can to serve more people, and that's, that's our primary mission. It's my great privilege to introduce our CEO, Michael McHale. Uh, Michael is someone I've known for uh, many years and have respected for many years as well. Um, his heart and compassion for the work that we do is unparalleled, and I am just honored and privileged to be able to stand beside him and beside all of the people that work here at True, but especially Michael, and serve all the communities that we serve, expand the services that we provide, and I'm so excited about Michael's vision and the direction that he's uh, uh, taking True Community Care, and he's asking us to come along, and, and so I'm so excited to introduce him, Michael McHale, the CEO of True Community Care. Thank you, David. We're so fortunate to have you on our leadership team. Your wisdom, enthusiasm, passion, and experience have already made a tremendous impact on our organization. You heard earlier from Sam Black about all that we've accomplished in the past year. And before I talk about our vision for the future, I wanted to first add my sincere appreciation to everyone who's helped us to be the organization that we are today. True was founded as a learning and teaching organization, and we have an opportunity and an obligation to our community to build on this legacy. Our inpatient hospice care center is the perfect setting for a learning and teaching site, an opportunity to focus on evidence-based medicine to improve outcomes and in interventional research in the care of our patients and families. The Care Center, in many ways, will become our classroom as we research interventions for the best outcomes and teach new staff about the specialties of hospice, palliative care, and PACE. Faced with an increasing nursing shortage, we're focused on growing our own. In addition to creating CNA to RN and LPN to RN scholarships, we've recently established a new graduate nursing residency program in advanced illness management. The residency program is in partnership with the University of Iowa and will offer education and hands-on experience at the care center. We're thrilled to be in a unique position to offer this type of program in our community. Another area of focus in our future is the enhancement of care for those in our community impacted by a dementia diagnosis. Our acquisition last year of Landmark Memory Care provides us with a unique opportunity to reimagine how specialized care can be developed to enable individuals to remain safely in the community while living with a dementia diagnosis. This could include the development of innovative day care center services, which could be made available to both the community at large and true PACE participants. We could potentially expand memory care housing to support those who are no longer able to safely remain in the community and need this higher level of care. Our challenge is not to replicate what is currently available, but to create something that is new and different in caring for this population. We formed the Landmark Advisory Committee, made up of members of the True Board of Directors, some of True's staff and other members of the community so that we could research the highest and best use of the Landmark Memory Care campus and to make recommendations for additional buildings and potential new programs and services to be offered on this campus. These recommendations will impact members of the broader community as well as PACE participants living with a dementia or other related diagnoses. The healthcare landscape is continuously changing and we pride ourselves in being two steps ahead, as much as we can be, to prepare for these changes. 
including investments in telecare to allow us to deliver just-in-time care as individuals and families manage through life being lived with serious illness. Working with key nonprofit partners to collaborate in the coordination of care for our communities and positioning our organization to support workforce development to address the shortages in the community and state of much needed healthcare workers. Thank you for being a part of our past, our present, and most excitingly, our future. It takes all of us to navigate the challenges and opportunities before us. Our community is counting on us to be here when they need us most. Up next, I want for you to hear how we, with your support, are impacting lives in our community. My name's Jeff Waters. I uh, currently live in Longmont, Colorado. However, born and raised in New Jersey, came out to school at the University of Colorado about 1969, and I have to tell you, the first thing I did when I saw Boulder was pick up the telephone, called my dad who was working in Manhattan and said, Dad, I'm never coming home again. I, I've always known of uh, Boulder Hospice from the 1970s when the hospice movement was gaining traction. However, recently when my sister was in need of palliative care and hospice care, I learned of true community care through Kaiser Permanente. My sister Doris was single, she was an attorney, um, and she was receiving care for a cancer diagnosis from her provider, which happened to be Kaiser Permanente. And this was a 10-year process for her. And she got through seven years just fine. I say just fine, you know, it's not an easy process to go through, but was cancer-free, but after seven years was diagnosed with metastatic cancer. And at that time, she shut down her law practice, sold her home, gave away all of her possessions, and moved in with me, which became a three-year process. You know, we, we don't know of end of life and what the dying process is until it's right in front of our face. And then, thank God, we have the option for hospice care. You know, true community care can provide the clinical support and emotional support, spiritual support, all that, but there's also family support on top of that. Knowing the specifics of the dying process helped all of us enormously. And that's something, frankly, if I was to have to repeat or I would give anyone any advice, would be, look, you find out what active dying is and how it exhibits itself in the very beginning. So you're not at home confused and scared and kind of disoriented. You know what's going on. And I got that from the center. Well, here's a little story. I was talking to Dr. Snow. Remember, I came from this medical background, right? All over the world. I've been in, in and out of ICUs, respiratory care centers, everything. Well, I asked her one day, I said, what kind of reimbursement do you get for a patient in your facility? And she told me, and I was shocked how little it is. And this is a fraction of the cost being reimbursed to true community care for that particular service. And I did a quick back of the envelope calculation and said, no, there's no way. You know, my services that we received, which are not being fairly compensated, at that time, remember my sister's on Medicare, well, I'm going to at least make up that gap in reimbursement. And to me, that was fair and needed. And if you pose the question to people, if you had to, out of your pocket, pay the expenses that were expended on behalf of you and your family during this period of time, knowing what the services are, would you pay it? And I can't imagine the answer would, wouldn't be anything, but yes, I certainly would. And you pay it a little forward. Talk to someone who has been challenged with a loved one in the end of life 
and talk to someone who has availed themselves of those services and then project and think of yourself when that time may come. Jeff, for sharing with us about your sister's journey, and thank you for being a generous financial supporter of True. I'm sure that your commitment to paying it forward will inspire all of us here today. Um, I also want to point out, you guys saw Kelly earlier in the video. Um, she was pregnant at the time of the video. She actually is having her baby right now as we speak. She texted us saying she hoped that she would be done in time to join us. I don't know if she is or not, but uh, we hope everything uh, went well with you, Kelly. So, um, good afternoon. I'm Chad Hartman, Director of Access and Palliative Care Services at True. When I'm not hosting a fundraising event, I'm making sure that everyone who needs True services has access to quality care. It's my pleasure to be here today with you. I'm live in studio this afternoon with my colleague and co-host, the lovely and talented Aaron Custer. Uh, Aaron is a clinical manager for True and oversees a team of CNAs, social workers, registered nurses, and chaplains as they work together as an interdisciplinary team to care and support for patients and families while on True Hospice. Aaron, why don't you tell everybody how the Fund Our Mission portion of this event is going to work? Thanks, Chad. It's truly my honor to be with you all today just as it has been my honor to take care of people who come to True for their end of life care. When the time for hospice has come, it means all test procedures have been exhausted and the patient is ready to be made comfortable and at peace. To be able to be one of the people to make this possible is such an honor and a privilege. I was drawn to hospice work because while working in acute care, I saw there was a great need for specialized end of life care. I also believe that no one has to die alone. I've always known that there are generous supporters donating behind the scenes to make our work possible. And I'm glad I get to see the fundraising in action today and help with this amazing process. To set the tone for this part of the event, I'm excited to announce that Bob Von Eschen Jr. has once again committed to a generous matching, matching donation today. Bob has offered to match up to $15,000 of what is raised today. That's right incredible. Now. It's incredible. Yes. Thank you, Bob. We started this morning at about $50,000. Um, thank you so much to our generous supporters. So it's our job today to get to the $65,000 mark um, in the next 15 minutes so that we can realize the full amount of Bob's matching gift. Are we up for it? We're up for it. We're up for it. And here's how this is going to work. Chad and I are going to walk through a few suggested dollar amounts, highest to lowest, to tell you, and we'll tell you what, um, what that dollar amount, what kind of impact that will have on, the tru on True's work. Um, if you're inspired to give at that level, please do so by clicking the donate button on your screen, or you can text TRUE2021 to the number 41444. If you'd rather text in a pledge, compose a text to 41444 with the message TRUE2021 space, the amount you want to give space, add your name, and it will show up on the screen as a pledge. And don't worry, you'll get a reminder on your phone to pay. Any amount helps. There's no gift too big or too small. And we will save time at the end for other amounts. All right, I think we're ready, Chad. All right, so here's the time that we ask for money, 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 money. 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 All right, we are going to start with the $2,500 or more level. Remember, if you want to give at a lower level than $2,500, please just hold off until you hear us call out that number. So you might be asking yourself, what does True do with $2,500? Well, I'm going to tell you. $2,500 can provide 25 family counseling sessions with our experienced grief counselors after the loss of a loved one. It can also allow PACE to provide a power mobility device for one PACE participant who relies on this equipment for things like 
going to appointments, grocery shopping, and accessing their home so that they don't get fatigued. Would anybody like to support with a gift of $2,500 today? $2,500 can also pay for um, a new registered nurse to become nationally board certified in one of the recognized hospice and home care clinical specialties. Nurses who are board certified have improved patient outcomes, um, proven to be happier in their profession, and have lower turnover. Anybody for $2,500? All right, we knew that that might be a little bit of a stretch. We had to ask. So, but I think I have a hunch that many of you will be able to jump in at the next lower levels. Erin, back to you. Thanks, Chad. All right, <clears throat> now we'll move to the $1,000 level. $1,000 could provide one day of care at our inpatient care center for someone without insurance. Our hospice care center is the only inpatient unit of its kind in the area and provides the highest level of around-the-clock care for hospice patients needing more intensive care. I've seen firsthand the relief that this level of care gives both the patients and the family. You also heard from Jeff what the care center did for his sister and their family. And when the patient doesn't have family, our care center staff fills that role for them. Who would like to donate today at the $1,000 level? Oh my gosh, we have Michael, we have Stephanie, we have Alan already at the $1,000. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. $1,000 could provide Healing with Horses scholarships for 10 grieving children to participate in an eight-week group. This gives children a space to grieve with others and partners children with horses who are powerful instruments in, of connection. Who else would like to give the $1,000 to support our mission? Come on, $1,000. $1,000 could provide clinical educational materials that are critical to safe and effective care. With COVID-19 still lingering, as well as the supply chain issues, PPE continues to be a concern. $1,000 could cover the PPE costs for staff to provide 184 individual patient visits. All right, $1,000 going once, going twice. Thank you to everybody who donated at this level. Absolutely, thank you for the $1,000 level. All right, now we're gonna move to the $500 level. A gift of $500 is the approximate cost of one telecare tablet, which allows for video communication. Um, I, along with the team, as you know, Aaron, have personally helped to build our telecare program. And I get to hear weekly how much having these additional access um, for just-in-time care means to patients and families. Our telecare technology helps us monitor a patient's disease progression and allow us to be proactive instead of reactive in their care. We have hundreds of patients we'd like to provide this for in the coming months and years, and as we work to expand true telecare program throughout our organization. So who wants to do $500? We want to expand our telecare program. Yes, Andy, thank you so much for donating at the $500 amount. All right, we also rely so heavily on our volunteers who carry out our mission, and we are so blessed, and I actually am always so amazed that we have over 300, yes, 300 dedicated volunteers on our team. They do such things as massage therapy, pet therapy. Um, we have an 11th hour program that if a patient doesn't have any uh, family members or friends around and they don't wanna die alone, we have volunteers that actually will sit with them um, as they take their last breath. So as we continue to grow and expand our services, um, we need to keep our recruiting and adding new volunteers. $500 can cover the cost of onboarding 10 new volunteers. Anybody else want to do $500 for our mission? Anybody $500? Um, $500 can also enable True to host two undergraduate community health nursing students for a semester. Um, True has already hosted 15 nursing students over the last three years and actually has a waiting list of interested students that want to come on. So anybody else for $500? Going once, going twice. All right, 
Thank you, everybody Thank you. who donated five hundred dollars. Yes. Thank you so much. All right, next up is $250. There are so many ways $250 can support our work. A gift of $250 could pay for materials for 40 veteran honoring packets, which includes pins, certificates, and military branch flags for veterans in our hospice program. We are so proud of our level five, we honor veteran status and the unique care we provide for our veterans and their families. Anyone up for 250 The $250 amount could provide a special headset for a PACE participant who is hearing impaired. This dollar amount could provide telecare for a patient through an app on their smartphone for one year. $250 could cover the cost of 3,000 gloves. This would provide gloves for staff to complete one month of visits. Who else would like to donate $250? We got Marcia who donated $250 right now. Thank you. $250 could provide more than 1,000 people in our community with advanced care planning tools, including conversation starter kits and medical agent cards for homeless populations. $250. Jen also, $250. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our donors. All right, Chad. All right, now we move to the $100 level. This is gonna be our last level that we're gonna be calling out. Jen, put me down for a $100 level. Um, $100 can provide a hotel room for one night for a hospice patient who is experiencing homelessness, but needing support and a peaceful place to receive end of life care. Aaron, I don't know if you remember this case, but it resonates with me and I think about it all the time. Um, we had a patient that her and her husband and her son were um, evicted from their home due to mold. Um, they actually were living out in their car for months until she was hospitalized. Um, though her last dying wish was not to die in a facility. Um, she was young, she didn't wanna die in a facility, so we offered um, to put them up in a hotel. The family um, was so appreciative of this um, and the, the palliative care team at the hospital just couldn't believe uh, the stuff that we were doing for this family. Yeah. It was great. So if you can contribute $100 so that we can keep providing this great care to the community, we would appreciate it. Anybody up for $100? Yes, Deborah, Mark, Alan, Audra. Ah, Thank that's you so, so great. Much. So great. Awesome. $100 can provide medical supplies for one hospice patient for two months. Um, it can provide aromatherapy supplies for one month at our inpatient unit, which I know our patients and family at our IPU uh, just appreciate so much. Um, anybody else for $100? Um, it can rolling in. Yeah, they're rolling in. It's great. Um, oh my gosh, Constance gave twenty five hundred. Constance, twenty five hundred dollars. Holy Thank cow, you. Constance! Thank you so much. That's awesome. A um, hundred dollars can provide um, rec center passes for up to four months for one pace participant who is able to access um, community rec center. Uh, we receive multiple requests like this um, from Boulder County participants who tend to be very active um, and like to exercise, especially in the winter months. Yes. It's coming. It's coming. It's they need chilly. to exercise. <laughs> we need $100. Anybody else $100? Going once. Going twice. Thank All right. You. Thank you, everybody. Yes. All right. Next up is any level. Lastly, we want to allow a few minutes for anyone else to give any amount. If you were moved by what you've heard today, please consider making a gift now. Every dollar counts. I am personally blown away by all of the support that we've seen here coming through here today. I'm going to take your generosity with me into the field and share with all of my colleagues how fortunate we are to have you standing by us. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for being with me today. And holy cow, drum roll, yes. drum roll, $67,000 we're at. Oh my gosh. Thank That's you amazing. again, Bob, for donating um, and doubling our impact at the $15,000 mark. So appreciated. Um, please accept our heart, heart, heartfelt thanks to each and every one of you um, who supported our mission today. We're gonna need you in the months and years ahead. Um, we're all in this together. Thank you to everyone who's contributed today. 
as you heard throughout the program, you play a big role in caring for our community. Thanks to your support, we'll care for nearly 1,000 people a day through all of our programs and services. We truly couldn't do this without you. As is our tradition, we'll close with a memorial slideshow featuring your loved ones who you have so generously shared with us.
Thank you again for sharing your loved ones with us. This concludes our program for today. Thank you for being with us.